The reason that he's so important is to do with the incredible technical versatility and freedom of, of his poetry. It was often said that, that W.H. Auden had this peculiar gift of making ordinary words sound terribly poetic by putting them into echoing patterns of sounds. It's as if the experiments of people like Pound and Eliot have freed him to go back to the roots of what English poetry can do. Stand, stand at the window as the tears scald and start. You must love your crooked neighbour with your crooked heart. It was late, late in the evening. The lovers, they were gone. The clocks had ceased their chiming and the deep river ran on. On the whole, I think one's rather proud uh, to serve a medium which, uh, in our time when the public has learned to consume almost everything, like cans of soup, poetry somehow or other remains something that you either have to read it or leave it alone. It's rather nice, I think, to, uh, that one has this medium. Uh, that at any rate, the fewest one readers may be, at any rate, one knows they can read. If Auden came to distance himself from politics, one fellow poet never wavered in his political commitment. Hugh McDermott was born Christopher Grieve in the Scottish borders in 1892. Fiercely patriotic, McDermott was a member of both the Communist Party and the Scottish National Party. He also listed Anglophobia as one of his hobbies. I'm a Scotsman, as you can hear. In the declaration of our growth, away back in 1320, perhaps the greatest democratic pledge of all time, my people, the Scottish people, swore that as long as a hundred of them remained alive, they would never allow themselves to be dominated by the English. <laughs> My people have done little, but betray that oath ever since. <laughs> Some poets get their engine out of a kind of rebellion against the world. He was deliberately very provocative. He thought that was part of his duty, to be provocative. Macdermott felt that Scotland had lost itself and that its identity could be reclaimed through poetry. But for him, the experience of being Scottish could not be properly expressed in English. He formulated an ambitious plan to create a new Scots language. I myself was convinced that there was nothing that the Scottish mind could conceive that couldn't be better expressed in Scots than in English or any other language. There's a whole range of feelings, of combinations of ideas, all related to the specific character of Scottish landscape and, and to the history of the Scottish race in relation to their landscape, which is embodied in the vocabulary of Scots and which is very little used the last couple of hundred years. That he passionately wanted to write in Scots and he wanted that not to be a backward-looking thing. He wanted to fuse modernism and language that often was antique. He didn't write dialect. He made a new plastic language. He was actually before his time. He was before his time while using this old language in this amazing way. In 1978, McDermott read his most famous work, A Drunk Man Looks at the Thistle, for the BBC. Oh, Scotland is the barren fig. Up, Carl's up, grounded jig. Old Moses took a dry stick and instantly it floored in his hand. Pull Scotland up and walk and say, it win a bud and blossom tea. A miracle's our only chance. Up, Carl's up and let us dance. The poem is a long monologue in which a drunk man lying on a hillside contemplates Scotland's position in the world and rages against its seeming passivity in the face of English domination. Inside this flimsy story of somebody lying drunk in a ditch, all this stuff goes through his head and uh, it's ancient, it's modern 
and uh, it's very angry and it's very anti-British empire. It's one of the most brilliant and game-changing poems that, that have ever existed. Macdermott helped spark a renaissance in Scottish literature, but in later life, he felt the battle was far from over. It's very questionable whether the whole business that I started wasn't too late. I was hopeful when English, England lost its empire, that it might not be, but England's fighting back, of course, and still thinks it is a world influence and a world mission and so on. I must get rid of England somehow or other, completely. You're still hopeful? Hmm? You're still hopeful? I'm still hopeful, yes. In the suburbs of North London, another poet was planning her own quiet rebellion. Stevie Smith lived with her spinster aunt and worked as a secretary. But behind the curtains of her suburban home, she created poetry that defied all expectation. Stevie Smith is a rebel, complete. She's going to write poetry, and she's going to mock the way we write poetry. She was actually taking the kind of assumptions we make about poetry and what's important and how poetry works, and she was just refusing to even try. Her poetry was both jaunty and unsettling, apparently naive, yet preoccupied with death. She's seen here in rare BBC footage from 1965. In my poems, the dead often speak and the ghosts come back. Here is a poor man who got drowned. His friends thought he was waving to them from the sea, but really he was drowning. Nobody heard him, the dead man, but still he lay moaning. I was much further out than you thought and not waving, but drowning. Poor chap, he always loved larking, and now he's dead. It must have been too cold for him. His heart gave way, they said. Oh, no, 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 it was too cold always. Still the dead one lay moaning. I was much too far out all my life, and not waving, but drowning. Beyond the apparent simplicity of her poetry, lay a carefully crafted and innovative style. The poetry that was written by gentlemen for gentlemen to read in the years when everybody learnt Latin and Greek at school is over, it's gone. You want rhyme, bugger you. You're not getting a rhyme. You want a story, I can't even be bothered telling you a story. She's going to write in chip-chop rhythm. She's going to use extraordinary limited vocabulary high level of repetition, and it works in a minimalist way. People in rather odd circumstances are what most of my poems are about, mixed up with arguments, religious difficulties, ghosts, deaths, fairy stories, and a general feeling of guilt for not writing more. Stevie Smith cultivated a certain view of herself as the, the kind of the hair-eyed, spinster of Palmer's Green, producing these, in a way, willfully eccentric poems, oddly naive little works, with these rather childlike drawings appended to them. And yet, I think, despite the, that sort of atmosphere of cultivated eccentricity, there's something very hard within her, and something very dark, too, that sort of destructive element there is inside her work. It's so raw and so powerful. The general feeling about love in the poems is nervous, like this poor little child who has been turned to stone in his mother's lap. She clutches him and cries, I'll have your heart, if not by gift, my knife shall carve it out. I'll have your heart, your life. It's precisely the darkness that reminds you that actually what you're mistaking for whimsy is this minimalism, 
that's asking you to back off and take another look. The onward march of the suburbs in the interwar years provided inspiration for a poet with an altogether more benign vision. Miss J. Hunter Dunn, Miss J. Hunter Dunn, furnished and burnished by Aldershot Sun, what strenuous singles we played after tea, we in the tournament, you against me. Love 30, love 40, oh, weakness of joy, the speed of a swallow, the grace of a boy. With carefulest carelessness, gaily you won. I am weak from your loveliness, Joan Hunter Dunn. John Betjeman was born in 1906, the son of a luxury goods tradesman. As a child, Betjeman was painfully aware of his family's low status in Britain's class system, a preoccupation that would later come to define his poetry. Around us are rovers and Austins afar, above us the intimate roof of the car. And here on my right is the girl of my choice, with the tilt of her nose and the chime of her voice and the scent of her rap and the words never said and the ominous, ominous dancing ahead. We sat in the car park till 20 to 1 and now I'm engaged to Miss Joan Hunter Dunn. Betjeman's verse saw a return to elements of poetry discarded by the modernists. Regular rhyme, familiar rhythm, and a wry sense of humour. A passionate lover of buildings, he championed Victorian architecture at a time when historic towns and cities were being threatened by modern ideas of progress. He became a poet of a, a passing England, an England that was being subsumed under the, the concrete of new developments. And there's something in the work like that, too. It's attached to rhyme and rhythm in an attractively conventional, consoling, comforting kind of way. So just as he defended the Victorian architrave, he's there defending certain kinds of end-stopped rhyme when other people are rejecting it or seeing that as like the equivalent of having too many knickknacks over your fireplace. He slightly strikes you as a fuddy-duddy, but actually he embraced TV, modern media, newspaper, radio. You know, he, he wanted to run with that, and I think he understood how uh, poetry could work, with, you know, with the general reader and the, and the general public. Well, if you mention the word poet to most people, they reach for the sleeping tablets. Well, there's one poet who manages to bridge that hitherto unbridgeable gap between the public and his art. Here's Sir John Betjeman. Betjeman found a natural home in front of the camera and was a regular guest on primetime chat shows. What is the function of a poet, though, Sir John? I think primarily it's to say things simply, shortly, rhythmically, memorably and it's luck it's inspiration there is such a thing as inspiration yes and when you tell me that thing if it's true that my poetry is uh, read by lots of people who don't ordinarily read poetry that's all i could want to happen and most poets are betjeman could speak to you know a couple of million people through one transmission and i take my hat off to anybody who can take poetry out to the to the general public, because the general public don't always want it. And he forged a, a link and a bond with them, and some of that was through his personality, uh, but a lot of it was, was, was through his work. I am a young executive, no cuffs and mine are cleaner. I own an oblong briefcase and I use the for firm's Cortina. In every <laughs> roadside hostelry from here to Burgess Hill, Les Maitres d'Hotel all know me well and let me sign the bill. You ask me what it is I do. Well, actually, you know, I'm partly a liaison man and partly PRO. Essentially, I integrate the current export drive, and basically, I'm viable from 10 o'clock till 5. Now, those poems, they're not facile. They're not just party tricks. 
He's got a good eye for, for so.